Let's see. Let's get recording in Streamlabs. If you're like, oh, this podcast sounds really boring. There's music and stuff in the post-production. Leave me alone. <laughs> I can only do so much at once. Okay. <clears throat> uh, 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 let's fucking do it. Let's riggedy roll. <laughs> riggedy rouse <is> coming. <laughs> okay. Oh, wait till you put that down. All right, here we go. Today is going to be an episode of legendary, almost mythical proportions. I am, of course, talking about the cryptic Bigfoot. And as we describe it and some of the evidence for Bigfoot, we'll also be providing counterpoints. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Just Nas Science Podcast. Each episode, we debunk ridiculous yet common science misconceptions we find online and get just a little salty about them. I'm your favorite science teacher, Lauren. And I'm the missing link, Nick. <laughs> Before we get started, we would love it if you came and checked out our social media pages like our Instagram and our Twitter. We post some fun stuff and interesting things on our Instagram and, you know, we just chat on Twitter. So you can find the links in the episode description. So what is Bigfoot? Well, the claim is that it's a creature that we have no hard proof or evidence aside from many word of mouth or night cam footage and extremely grainy photos. So it's supposedly a hairy ape-like creature that stands anywhere between 6 and 15 feet tall. It's often reported as being really foul-smelling and can move really silently and occasionally emits a high-pitched screech. Uh, although we were watching a documentary yesterday we'll, we'll talk about and sometimes it doesn't. It's like, like a loud... Like just, a howl? Y- yeah, or like a whooping. But yeah. anyway... Bigfoot apparently will throw rocks at you if it feels <laughs> threatened. I guess there are baby Bigfoots that they want to protect. And if you consider how strong an ape is, if you have a really tall ape, like a 9, 10 foot ape that's throwing a rock, that's gonna, that thing is going to hurl at you at insane speeds. Think like Randy Johnson, but hairier and much stronger. <laughs> oh my God, I'm just thinking of the orangutans at the zoo and how strong they are and the the huge tires that they would just throw around like it was nothing like those crossfit this. tires that we like really need to like focus to flip think think of it like this randy johnson threw a baseball at about 100 miles an hour and it hit a bird and then the bird exploded that's <laughs> yeah, true now add i don't know how many 100 pa- 150 like, pounds plus three more feet yeah and now it's a rock coming at your dome well randy, randy was pretty thin so let's say at least 200 more pounds <laughs> yeah oof, that's not gonna go well all right so let's let's counter this bigfoot claim a little bit so let's for argument's sake assume that the average height of a bigfoot is about 10 feet seeing as that they're typically described between 6 and 15 we'll say 10 is a good middle ground So Bigfoot enthusiasts say that modern day Sasquatch, you know, Bigfoot also known as Sasquatch, is a relative of a now extinct giant ape called Gigantopithecus from southern China. Yes, that is actually a real thing. I also had to look that up because I've never really heard of it. I I learned about it literally last night. So fossil records actually showed that this giant Gigantopithecus was about 10 feet tall, but he was weighing about 1,100 pounds. That's a thick boy. <laughs> that is a huge boy. <laughs> so this species of giant ape went extinct about 100,000 years ago at the beginning of the last ice age. And the reason for its extinction, like many other large-scale animals such as the ground sloth and giant birds, is their caloric intake. You know, with a changing environment, aka the ice age that was approaching, there wasn't enough food and enough calories to sustain this giant ape. So my question is, why would an equally large relative have survived if Gigantopithecus did not? And even so, you can make the claim, well, maybe Gigantopithecus and some of these other animals were strictly herbivores. And there are claims that Bigfoot is... Uh, an omnivore that it's been seen carrying off deer or that there have been deer with broken ankles which I just assume they got schooled up in a basketball game and they got their ankles broken that's a bad <laughs> joke uh, don't laugh at that yeah but okay, those deer because of easily like, twi- like twisted yeah, in a sh- ditch I- or a hole it's like I don't think that necessarily means and Yeti came along just broken Yeti is different Yeti yeah, is from right. the Alps it's the, it's the cousin the cousin right that lives in the Alps 
uh, and the abominable still. Well, that's that's what it's also known as. But yeah, I mean, let's pretend that Bigfoot was around and it's eating. It's going to spend its entire day eating. That's it. That's all it can do. And and animals like apes do spend most of their day eating. But because of the huge size difference, I mean, think about it. Any woodland area would be decimated by a family of big feet. What is big? How do you pluralize Bigfoot? <laughs> is it big feet, big foot? Big footies. <laughs> no, I don't like that at all. <laughs> Uh, so it's it's it, let's okay let's anyway I can yeah, yeah, I can spend too much time on that. The next counterpoint that that I have is the it's common for Bigfoot descriptions that they have this high pitched vocalization, but what giant animal is giving off high pitched noises? It doesn't really happen. Smaller animals like mice and birds have high pitched sounds, and things like bears and lions are much deeper. I will acknowledge that we haven't discovered every animal out there, and there's a chance that a larger animal makes a high-pitched noise, like chimps can make like some high-pitched like screeching type of noises, but when they're 10 feet tall, it's pretty unlikely. Also, just to go back to the decimation of forest or the food source for a Bigfoot, if, if a deer population gets a little too overpopulated, they could decimate a forest, and it's just deer. So imagine a 10 foot large animal with like, I don't know, 7,000 calorie intake need a day. So just kind of put that in perspective. But as of July 2020, there have been over 5,000 Bigfoot sightings in the U.S. alone. And that's a lot of accounts. So it's definitely worth getting into, especially when there's 600 or over 600 coming from Washington state alone. I don't know if that's per year. That seems like a lot. 5,000 a year would be Did a I lot. Did I say per year? No, no, no. I just, I don't know at, at what time this 5,000 sighting started. Like, oh, okay, yeah. Like, is it from 2004? Is it from 1950? I don't, I don't know. Right, right. Um, so, there have been two sightings from Washington in January 2020. <laughs> so, that's the start of the year. <laughs> do, do you, and so, wait, there's this thing about the Mothman where, like, whenever you see the Mothman, disaster is about to happen. And it was a bridge collapse in, was it like Chicago? Oh, I think I remember you telling me that. And then. people say that they saw a man with wings, which they assumed to be the Mothman, standing right. at the at the top of the bridge, like like literally at the height of the bridge, moments before it collapsed. And then when they looked back, it wasn't there. And then the bridge collapsed. And so sometimes people say that the Mothman will be the, you know there before some crazy accident so or tragedy. So you Bigfoot. Is you know appearances happen right before a disastrous year? <laughs> uh, maybe uh, listen. This happened the day before Kobe's uh, helicopter crashed. Actually, so maybe I'm just, listen. I'm just saying it's not. And we're talking about Bigfoot. Nothing is not a possibility. <laughs> yeah. Um, but one of these sightings in Washington was caught by a camera from the Washington Department of Transportation. Um, and we have a link to the video in the episode description, but it's literally the same as every other video you see of Bigfoot, or Bigfoot I say in quotes. Um, you know, they're off in the distance. It's a humanoid creature walking with its back to us just further and further away. So really, you know, again, and it's just so crazy with so many deep fake videos today and being able to doctor things, it's really hard to figure out like what's real and what's not. Deep fake costumes effects right i mean you can you can really alter a video i mean i've seen videos of president obama saying things that he never actually said like they took a speech from someone else in history and just put it to obama and were able to alter his lips to make it look like he was giving this speech it is incredible what technology can do and it's dangerous yeah. and scary and when you use technology in this way I mean, it can make some pretty convincing videos and photos. And especially if the video videos are taking place at night when, you yeah. know, it's grainy too. You've seen those ape costumes, those gorilla costumes. You get a big guy to wear one at night on a camera. You wouldn't be able to know what the heck it is. So, yeah, you know, there's a lot sure. of ways to fake it. There's also been numerous TV shows that always advertise the latest technology and groundbreaking science as if there's companies pumping money into Bigfoot tracking research and discovery. Because, like, cancer isn't a thing. <laughs> <laughs> now, you can imagine that I did spend a good part of my weekend searching for scientific articles about Bigfoot. And guess what? 
There aren't any. The <laughs> most you'll find is articles about cognitive behavioral therapy in Native Americans from someone named Dolores Bigfoot. And don't get it mixed up. I'm not making fun of her name. But if you do a Google, uh, if you do a Google Scholar search, that's what comes up. And I do think it's kind of funny that when you search like in Google Scholar, you find articles from a person named Bigfoot. <laughs> oh man! Uh, and I wonder how you get that name though. I mean, she might be a Native American. No, I know, but like, what you know, you know, I mean, what, what. <laughs> Gives you your Native American name. Oh, you're asking the wrong person. Sorry. So I did find one scientific study about Bigfoot or Big... I'm going to start calling him Big Feet. And it was a study from 2014 <laughs> titled Genetic Analysis of Hair Samples Attributed to Yeti, Bigfoot, and Other Anomalous Primates, which they did exactly what the title suggests. They took hair samples from uh, from 30 different species or 30 different like uh, samples so they didn't know what they were from. yeah 30 samples that were attributed to either the yeti which is the alps version of the uh of the bigfoot, bigfoot and bigfoot and a few other similar creatures that exist in like india so the samples came from russia six different u.s states uh nepal and india and it turns out Bigfoot hair is a lot like bear and wolf hair because that's what all the samples came back as, uh, as one would have guessed. <laughs> oh, well, that sucks. <laughs> um, but we'll say the authors do make the statement, which we agree with, that the absence of evidence doesn't necessarily prove non-existence. You know, there's plenty of animals um, that have surfaced recently due to deforestation, climate change, and more advanced technology like the tiny frog found in Bolivia and a really cute small mouse lemur they which are you adorable. should look up. They're adorable. Kind of looks like a bush baby but just like very lemur-ish. Um, sometimes called a pseudo gecko. Something. The small lemur is not a pseudo gecko. Pseudo oh, gecko oh, sorry. is something, something else. called something called a pseudo gecko. You're going to do that over. Okay. <laughs> so like a tiny frog found in Bolivia a small mouse lemur, which is extremely cute. You should definitely check it out. And something called a pseudo gecko. Um, and there's also a giant scorpion, which despite its size is actually only three to four inches long. Um, still terrifying though. Um, and there's, and there are like, listen, there have been many scientific claims that have come through throughout history that have been originally looked at like you were crazy, like Galileo claiming that the earth was actually the center of the solar system instead of the sun. Like, he was almost killed by the church for claiming that. They made him walk back his statement and say, like, oh, I'm just kidding, guys. I wasn't real. <laughs> um, you know, for various reasons, people might want discoveries or not. Or we just don't have the technology for it yet. So I get it. And it, I do understand why some people might not want Bigfoot to exist. Because then it's the idea that there are human-like creatures, like, we're it kind of really pokes a hole in religion a little bit, right? Like there are these That's other true. potentially intelligent, giant, human-like creatures. And if they serve as an intermediate between our ancient, like our ancestors and modern humans, well, I mean, then that, that's a pretty big point for evolution, I would say. Yeah. And it's also just kind of scary to think about. Yeah, I mean, if Bigfoot can exist, what else could be out there? What else right. have Loch we not monster. found? monster, it's there. But that's something else that, like, why can Bigfoot exist, but other creatures, if I tell people that I, I, I've said this before, when we talk about psychics and astrology, why can that be real? But it, vampires, if I say I'm a vampire hunter, uh, if I say I'm a vampire hunter, now all of a sudden I'm an asshole, but, like, you can be a medium or a psychic and people are like, oh, cool. Like, how, how are those different? I don't know. I think they're just um, different. I don't know. So there but, is, what? But I was going to say, the idea that this Bigfoot exists, listen, a lot, of, a lot of new species that we discover, a lot of times they are smaller, and reason why we haven't found them sooner. But a, a 10-foot tall ape, you know, with a caloric intake of three NFL linebackers is kind of hard to miss. Yeah, plus considering that the supposedly, and this is according to, uh, I'm going to call them Bigfoot experts. I'll give them the benefit of the Just doubt. enthusiasts. No, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. They probably know a lot about the, the lore and mystery and all this kind of stuff about Bigfoot. So I'll call them experts on Bigfoot. <laughs> on big feet. They, you know, they they are in pretty pretty good agreement that Bigfoot lives in 
family pods, which means there's a few of them at once. So it's not just one Bigfoot that is popping up all over the country. There's, these people think that there is, I shouldn't say these people, but individuals who, who believe and study in Bigfoot think that they live in family pods or, or very small social groups, which would only devastate areas where they forage that much more because now there's a, like there's like four of them who have crazy high food demands but they you know they they reproduce which I would love to see that and <laughs> would you yeah yeah I, I think I really would it would be like watching three apes on st- like three apes like on top of each other <laughs> uh, and and they move throughout the country it's really amazing how they can be so elusive so we got a lot of this information at least about what experts on Bigfoot think from a show called Chasing Bigfoot The Quest for Truth which is basically hearing stories like I said from Bigfoot hunters and and experts one of the people interviewed said they found a family of Bigfoot which implies like I said that they're able to reproduce Uh, they shot one which they then buried and the others got away when they went back to look at the location where the Bigfoot got shot that only a small tuft of fur could be found and like why so many questions why if you shot one and like you you have possession of it or it's in your possession why would you bury it why would you not be all over the news with this like yeah why wouldn't you just take a photo but like also how did you bury it were you going to the woods with a gun and a shovel and that's a huge ass hole to dig so there were, there was no evidence of a hole yeah there's, like, there's so on. many things that are problematic with this statement. Yeah, like disturbed soil or something. Like, please, come on. It sounds so silly. Yeah. This guy doesn't want to be on the news. Um, but some other ridiculous claims from Chasing Bigfoot, The Quest for Truth. Um, I can't remember if it was the 1950s or 60s, but it was a while back, and um, there was a construction site where one morning they mysteriously found this giant big footprint that they then, like, casted or whatever and saved. Um and it gave rise to the name Bigfoot. And it, that kind of just perpetuated the lore. Um, but after the owner of the construction site passed away, years later, his son came out and said that it was falsified. And dad had these big, giant wooden feet that he used to make the, the print. Um, so, again, you know, kind of debunked there. Yeah, and, and the same thing happened with the... The, like the most classic video of Bigfoot when they like see him in the woods and they're tracking the camera cannot stay still for a second and you see the Bigfoot walking and he turns and he just keeps walking into the woods and that's th- that video was uh, I believe I don't know some people think it's real but I think the general consensus is that it was uh, forged or fake mm-hmm. So on the Bigfoot documentary, there was a random dude who I don't really know who he was, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but he said that Bigfoot fur and skin, because it's not the entire thing that's covered in, in uh, fur, like their face and their sometimes feet, their chest. Sometimes uh, bear. Yeah. So they can have skin and fur that come in all different colors from witness accounts. And he it was weird because he said that signifies a large genetic diversity, which could be expected in a species like that. But the question is, why would you expect large genetic diversity from... A small uh, population. Uh, yeah, such a small population of individuals. I mean, th- unless they're... Th- th- I don't want to go too into how genetic diversity works, but there has to be like some barrier that prevents uh, them from breeding with one another, which could be the case in somewhere like Seattle. There's a lot of mountains. There could be things that prevent groups from from interacting with one another but but my take is okay if there was a large gene pool that means there would have to be a lot of individuals and we wouldn't be having this conversation if they exist or not we would probably know yeah um so this more likely means that the eyewitness accounts are just inconsistent not to mention even with the couple of thousand individuals there are they would have to be like like i said bottlenecking of the pool which would make them very susceptible to things like disease and uh, if food was limited, which when you're consuming as much food as you do, it would be limited eventually. Mm-hmm. Well, or you would have yeah, to push. Especially if they're spread out along amongst the country. Like let's say there's 4,000, but they're all throughout the U.S. and Canada. Well, there's not a lot in each area. So you're probably going to have inbreeding and things like that occurring. So 
Not a very likely situation. Um, another guy on the show was saying that they must be extremely intelligent because they're bipedal, meaning they walk on two feet. And since humans are really the only other species that are bipedal, he says, then and we're intelligent, that must mean they're intelligent, which is totally egocentric. No, it was funny because earlier that day, before we watched the documentary, I came across a research study that made this the suggestion that bipedal walking predated our larger brain size. So the so necess, um so walking upright on two two feet or two legs doesn't necessarily require intelligence since in our evolutionary history we were upright prior to our large powerful brains. Gotcha. Um and what was I going to say? Oh, this is you. A third gentleman says that they're very adaptable to any environment that has food, water, and shelter, which is like <laughs> pretty much everything. That's my favorite claim. It's like, well, any animal could survive if they have adequate food, water, and shelter. Yeah. like That's not like a very strong claim for them. <laughs> like, it's pretty easy to do if you have those three things. Just saying. Um, but a lot of them are, well, there's a little bit of um, debate or controversy around whether they're aggressive or not. But a few of the gentlemen in the show said that they must not be aggressive since they often throw rocks, but they throw them at like people's feet or they miss people. So they're saying it would just, it seems like just warning throws. And we're like, what if they just have bad aim? Yeah, throwing is a learned skill. Exactly. So. Uh, throwing accurately is a, is a learned skill. You're not just going to pick up a rock or a baseball for the first time and be like throwing hundreds of yards like no problem like no it's, it's not Hitting easy people right in the dome like yeah it's not gonna happen and so. my god we're lucky that they're not aggressive <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we too. would be tear us a limb from a limb <laughs> uh and people this is my personal favorite claim people think that bigfoot is magical or extraterrestrial just because we can't explain something though doesn't necessarily make it magical like, can you explain how magnets or batteries work? I mean, science can, but can you as an individual? Right. And well, it's, I, if, you know, I can't really necessarily explain all that. So it must be, uh, must be magic. Must uh, be put here by yeah. the aliens. And, and prior to our actual understanding of how magnets work, there were magnets. Like rocks had magnetic properties to them so were they just magical rocks or this or is there something else obviously now we know that it's something else well a lot of things before we could really explain them with science had lore behind them and they were thought to be magical or from the gods or you know things like that whether it was um, viking lore or native american so yeah a lot of times people default to this idea that something is otherworldly or has these powers if we can't explain it but it, it is interesting that uh, there's a potential for Bigfoot to be psychic because apparently people have seen Bigfoot and had some paranormal activity or connection with him, whether it was like a psychic connection or just like a feeling of uh, uncomfort or something, which is a human evolutionary response. When you are in the woods... And you're either by yourself or you're maybe with one other person. You're unfamiliar with the area. Maybe it's getting dark. Maybe you're hearing noises. Like, Of course you're going to feel uncomfortable. Our, our bodies were designed to be afraid, to get on high alert, to have that someone's watching feeling so that we stay on guard and that we could protect ourselves if something were to happen. Yeah, that does make sense. But if these people are saying right before they saw a Bigfoot... They could hear it talking in their head like Lady Galadriel from Lord of the Rings who could speak to you in your head. <laughs> Lauren just watched Lord of the Rings last night, so that's why that's... Rewatching for like the 20th time. But that would be something different rather than just like feeling the hair on the back of your neck stand up. Yeah, but, it is. Yeah, it's, it's nothing. That doesn't really prove anything. But the question is, why do people believe in Bigfoot at all despite the decades lack of concrete evidence? There was a 2018 article from the Smithsonian Magazine that talks about how the search for Bigfoot is like the search for freedom. And this is a quote directly from that article. The hunt for Bigfoot emulates an earlier mode of discovery when new knowledge was not the product of advanced degrees and expensive machinery, but rather curiosity, bravery, patience, and survival, end quote. And that's something that I can personally connect with. You watch movies and read stories and even listen to other podcasts about people who have 
gone on these thrilling adventures, exploring and making huge discoveries. I want to go on a backpacking trip for the same reason. And I don't mean I want to take a trail that a million other people have taken. Like I want to get and explore something new. I want to get out there. And I want to be able to tell someone about it. I want to be able to write about it. I feel like there is so little yet so much to be discovered about our planet. And all we have to do is get the courage to go out there and do it. But ultimately, things like Mothman, Slenderman, Bigfoot, its cousin in the Alps, and so many other cryptids are probably more of a testament to the creativity and imagination of humans rather than our biological past or present. Agreed. How do you feel about, like, getting out into the woods and... Like, do do you agree with that sentiment that searching for yes. Bigfoot is searching for a more primal or freeing? Yeah, I do. I mean, there's plenty of times I just feel like the the incredible urge and need to get out and have an adventure, right, and do something like that. Um, and a lot of times, fear holds me back. I know you've been trying to go on a backpacking trip, and I've only done them with like a like a guide or someone who knows the way. So to just do one on our own really does make me nervous for like water, like finding water and having enough food. You know, so I, I but I get that. I, I understand that feeling. And I do think, you know, the idea of being able to create this knowledge and look and discover something without having to have this expensive, fancy degree, I think is something that is pretty innate in us. Yeah. That's going to do it for us today. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe, leave a review and especially share it. It takes literal seconds to hit subscribe and click the five star review button and it would mean a whole lot to us. Positive ratings and shares on social media are the biggest ways you can help us spread this good, good science to even more people. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at JustNASScience. You can also visit our website, JustNASScience.com, where you can watch YouTube videos, read blog posts, or submit questions and suggest topics for future episodes. And don't forget, we put out new episodes every Tuesday. And as always, thanks again for listening. Later, you nerd. Later, Gators.